Stephen Kocher, missing from St. George, Utah. Stephen was from Texas, and he'd been living in St. George. The 30-year-old man was excited for the future, but the plans he had derailed pretty quickly. He had by then graduated from college with a degree in communications. The financial crisis hit in 2007, and then a recession started. So in the spring of 2009, things were tough for Stephen, and he was doing all that he could to find employment. He got a job in marketing, but unfortunately he lost that shortly after he was hired. His family would say, though, that he remained pretty positive while this was happening pretty sure that he would be able to get a new job. But despite him seeming like he was pretty positive about the future, he just disappeared. We do know that he found part-time employment, handing out flyers for a window washing company, but it wasn't enough to live on. On December 10th, 2009, Stephen stopped by his ex-girlfriend's house in Ruby Valley, Nevada. She wasn't home, but her family was, and they invited him in for lunch but he would say he couldn't stay as he was on his way to visit his family in Sacramento, and he was concerned about the weather. It wasn't true, though. He doesn't even have family in Sacramento. By December 10th, Stephen was three months behind on his rent, and his landlord called his father to try to facilitate being able to get paid for the rent. He had listed his father on his rental application. This was extremely upsetting for Stephen. He told his father that he was behind on the rent and that he wasn't answering his calls. Stephen's father kept calling from him, and Stephen finally did answer when he was inside of a grocery store. His grandmother had written a check for the back rent, and Stephen's pride was hurt, and he became pretty angry, and he hung up on his father. He followed up the exchange a few days later, saying he's got it under control, and he's able to pay the rent on his own now. Stephen talked to one of his siblings the next day also. To none of those people did he mention he was taking a road trip, much less why. His mom spoke to him after that, saying she transferred money into his account. He seemed to be fine during that phone call, and he apologized for overreacting before. Yet he never told her he was on the road. It's unknown exactly where he went, but phone pings would show he drove over 1,000 miles those previous few days, and then was back at work. It's known he went to Salt Lake City and Springfield, Utah, among other destinations. He arrived back home on the 10th. On December 12th, at about 9 p.m., his cell phone would ping near Overton, which is about 90 minutes away from his home. The next ping happened in Mesquite, Nevada. Then, by 8 p.m. that night, he was back home in St. George. One known stop was that he went to a Walmart and bought gifts for his niece and nephew. This was at 8 p.m. A few hours later, he returned home, though it's not clear where he went between Walmart at 8 p.m. and home around 10 p.m. Once he was home, he didn't stay there, however. The neighbors would report that he came home for only a short time and he left again. That morning of December 13th, a friend from the town of St. George would call him at about 9 a.m. and ask him to attend a church meeting. Stephen is described as being very involved in the church. He responded that he couldn't do so, as he was in Las Vegas. He offered to go back if it was important, but the man explained he too was in Las Vegas, and that was why he wanted Stephen to attend the meeting. So he declined the offer, saying he could go back from Vegas himself. And while the cell phone ping showed he ended up in Vegas, no one knows why. A few other members from his church would call in the next few hours, as he was supposed to officiate his service, but he told them he wouldn't make it. His next ping show up in Henderson, Nevada. For anyone unaware, Henderson is just outside of Las Vegas. I've actually passed through St. George, Utah myself on a road trip to Vegas, and he hadn't gone terribly far, as you can see here. St. George to Las Vegas isn't an abnormal trip and St. George and Mesquite are even closer. It's unknown if he was gambling or delivering something or exactly what it was he was doing. Obviously, Las Vegas is a great place to gamble, but Stephen was apparently a pretty devout Mormon, and so it might be more likely that he was delivering something as opposed to gambling. And some more evidence of this would come up 
shortly after. On that same day, December 13th, 2009, Stephen was seen on a home surveillance video parking his white 2003 Chevy Cavalier. He parked it at the end of an upscale retirement community located in Henderson, Nevada, around 11.54 a.m. They have footage from a couple different cameras that day, and it shows Stephen exiting the car and walking away. But he returned a short time later to retrieve something from his car. That was the last time he was seen. The fact he left, came back, and got something, and left again, makes me think he was probably checking if someone was home and came back to get whatever it was he was to deliver. But that's just my personal opinion. By the time he came back to his car and left again, it was six minutes later. Some of the witnesses would say he exited the car with something that looked a lot like a file folder. The second camera facing the street caught him walking toward a home, and he was seen walking north and crossing the street. Someone in the HOA noted that his car was still there the next day and that someone from the HOA contacted his family. According to another source, the police were contacted by the HOA four days later, and it was them who contacted the family. That is the problem with a lot of these stories. Things conflict from news account to news account, and it's hard to know. But if I were to guess, we know the flyers were located in the back of his car. My guess is the HOA called the employer who owned those flyers. And that was how the family was contacted. Because there's some indication that they moved on it and were looking for him quicker than the four-day claim along with the police. It stated that the employer referred them to the family. And in return, they were alerted that there was a problem. The parents would immediately go to the site and begin looking for him. By Christmas, the police too were searching. And there were searches of them in the surrounding desert by helicopter and all-terrain vehicles, but it turned up nothing. It appears the police have a good idea where he was going, based on what could be seen in the footage of where he was walking. A police report indicated they saw him speaking to a person, and that person would later proclaim they don't recognize Stephen or know him. The neighbor went so far as to state they don't trust anyone due to the drug lifestyle of the people living in that area. They would say that they don't have any friends in the area, and and this was supposed to imply to the police that he couldn't know Stephen because he didn't know anyone who lived in the area. Years later, an interview, which can be found in the description below, a neighbor spoke anonymously to a local TV station, and there's some indication it's the neighbor who was originally questioned by the police. That neighbor claimed Stephen went to his home, knocked, and had left by the time the man opened the door saying he could see Stephen on the other side of the street. He then allegedly proclaimed the man, said, I need money, saying Stephen was walking on the other side of the street with no sidewalk at the time when he said it. The neighbor claims he didn't speak to him, he just closed the door. When the police questioned him originally, the police would note there was evidence of something big having happened inside his house. There had been a lot of sound complaints for this specific home. The police would also say there had been a lot of complaints about people coming and going. When the police had arrived at the home itself to question the man, they would note the furniture in the living room was all gone. There were holes in the walls and other damage visible to the officers. If he explained to the police why this was the case, it's not noted. That specific house was noted as having unusual traffic the day Stephen went missing. A different news account states that Stephen was going door to door looking for someone specific, so I'm not actually sure exactly which is true. It is known, though, that after Stephen went missing, the first ping indicated it was a few miles north of where his car was found, in what is described as a really rough neighborhood. That ping happened at 5 p.m. It pinged again about two hours later, and it was another two miles from where that first ping happened. It would then continue to ping off a tower near US-95 and Russell Road for three days until the phone's battery died, all pretty close to where his car was found. But there is zero proof that Stephen was ever at either of those locations or if someone else had his phone. The investigation also found that the day after he went missing, someone used his phone to check his voicemail. I don't remember there ever not being a code that you had to get into your voicemail. Does anyone remember in older phones that you could just call it? 
we do know that there was a message there from his landlord about the overdue rent. There seems to be some implication that one of the voicemails from the landlord was checked after he went missing, but it's not specifically clear. And because this one isn't accurate from story to story, I'm kind of hesitant to believe that. However, it was said that the landlord, Brett Bishop, was kind of a sketchy character. He'd left messages between the 13th and the 16th over a dozen times. But of course, people have a right to expect their rent too, so that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But this man was apparently no stranger to the police. He had been charged in the past with possessing drugs and illegal firearms. He'd also stolen vehicles and committed some kind of a fraud. Stephen's father was concerned that perhaps he was involved with something nefarious involving Bishop, but Bishop himself has never been named as a person of interest. Stephen's father had drug-sniffing dogs go over to his son's house, but the dogs didn't alert on any narcotics at all. There's no indication he'd been making the kind of money that comes from selling them. While there is a mystery as to where he was driving, especially since money was so tight, it doesn't appear that the narcotics were involved at all. At least no proof was found of this. More searching was done of the area in 2015, but no evidence of what happened to him was ever found. The police would say they have found no evidence of foul play. His parents, for their part, are positive he would never take his own life or disappear forever. Unfortunately, his father passed in 2011 without ever knowing what happened. Stephen was 5 foot 10 and 180 pounds when he went missing. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He would be 43 if he's alive today. Stephen Kocher has been missing for 13 years. As always, thank you so much for watching. The current goal for the channel is 20,000 subscribers. Please consider subscribing and hitting the bell so you don't miss new episodes. Thank you so much to everybody commenting, even with just an emoji. It really has made a big difference. Without it, there isn't a channel. So thank you guys so much. Take care of yourselves and each other.